Today on the Women Mind the Water Art of the Series on WomenMindTheWater.com is speaking with Rebecca Rutstein, an accomplished artist who has received many awards and been involved in numerous public exhibitions. Rebecca's career has taken her to remarkable places, including the high seas and the ocean floor. The Women Mind the Water Art of the Series podcast on WomenMindTheWater.com engages artists in conversation about their work and explores her connection with the ocean. Through their story, Women Mind the Water hopes to inspire and encourage action to protect the ocean and her creatures. Today, I'm speaking with Rebecca Rudstein. Women Mind the Water is pleased to have Rebecca here to talk about her art and her efforts to share scientific discoveries gathered on and below the ocean. She is the recipient of a Pew Fellowship in the Arts, has had her collaborations funded by the National Science Foundation in numerous international exhibitions, including an immersive video installation currently on view at the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Rebecca has participated in seven expeditions at sea, including two to the bottom of the ocean. Rebecca's artwork strives to build connections with nature, inspire wonder, and foster environmental stewardship. Today, we will focus on her Artist at Sea series. Her latest Artist at Sea residency, her seventh, was aboard the University of Hawaii's research vessel, Kilo Moana. The work created from that residency is to be exhibited this year at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Oregon State University, and James Madison University in Virginia. Welcome, Rebecca. I'm extremely grateful to Karen Romano Young, a previous guest on the Women Mind the Water Art of the Series podcast, who's suggesting you as a guest. You two were aboard the same vessel during one Artist at Sea residency. Let's talk about how you came to be part of that residency and how you reframe research into your artwork. I'd like to start by asking how someone with a BFA in painting from Cornell and an MFA from the University of Pennsylvania, both universities located inland, developed sea legs and a taste for working at sea. That's such a great question. Um, and but first, I just wanted to say thank you for having me. It's um, you have a wonderful roster of artists, and I'm I'm really happy to be part of it. Um, it, again, it's a great question, and I think that um, it all really started from a class that I took at Cornell um, on geology. It was an intro geology class. Um, it was for non-science majors. I was an art major, and we would go on field trips um, to state parks and see the sort of exposed geology um, that was that was happening and learn firsthand the, the kind of forces underneath the surface that were causing this and these sort of, you know, plate tectonic processes and geologic processes. And so I, I became fascinated with this um, subject and it wasn't something that I really uh, wove into my artistic practice for many years, but it sort of planted the seed. And I eventually, um, after graduate school, um, and it was probably about 10 years after I had taken that geology class, I started thinking about incorporating this idea of these forces causing upheaval. Um, and it was really uh, at first a metaphor, um, it really for kind of interpersonal relationships I was experiencing in my twenties, thinking about how forces underneath kind of shape outcomes. And, but then it became like a real kind of genuine pursuit in thinking about and, and wanting to learn about geology in different areas um, of the world. And so I started going on residencies, artistic residencies. I would apply um, for different programs and um, to learn about the geology and to create painting narratives about them. And I found myself in uh, Banff, Canada, exploring the Canadian Rockies. And then I ended up in Hawaii, um, doing a residency exploring the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii and trying to understand the processes that, that form the Hawaiian islands. And just to be quick here, it was there that I discovered a map of the ocean floor, um, a, a multi-beam sonar map, which is essentially a map that is imaged through sound waves. Um, uh, pings of sound are sent down to the bottom of the ocean and um, the time that it takes to return back up to the surface to the ship um, is measured. And so 
you can create these, these sort of profiles of the ocean floor topography. And so I was just fascinated by this map and fascinated by this hidden landscape. And all of a sudden I realized that I was only looking at the tip of the iceberg when I was looking at the, the islands themselves. Um, and I wanted to go down there. I wanted to go see this, this hidden landscape at the bottom of the ocean. And that was sort of the springboard for my um, whole endeavor into kind of wanting to learn about the deep ocean. So what sort of challenges do you encounter when you try and translate the work of scientists into your artwork? For me, my personal challenge is to sort of be able to quote unquote communicate science without my work being didactic. You know, I want my work to have, you know, a visceral um, experience for the viewer. Okay. So I imagine it's tricky to work in a studio on board a boat, which is always in motion. What issues do you have to overcome in order to work in a studio aboard a boat? It's a great question, and it, it is really challenging. I will say each time I've been at sea, um, I've had a different kind of setup. You know, sometimes I've had a, as little as, you know, maybe a foot and a half of tabletop space, and I have a scientist right next to me on, on a very small ship that happened um, in the Salish Sea. Um, other times I've had actually a whole lab to myself where I can spread out. But I think the two biggest challenges are one, anticipating what I need to bring with me because it's not like there's an art supply store down the street, you know. So whatever I bring with me or whatever I ship ahead of time is what I have to work with. And so um I really need to anticipate what I might want to use and 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 what materials I'll need. Um the other main challenge that I've experienced um is the motion of the ship. Um the motion of the ship is 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 can be very intense at times. Um, in fact, my very first expedition at sea, I was actually sailing from the Galapagos Islands to San Diego on a three week journey. Um, <clears throat> and we were actually trailing a hurricane off the coast of um, Mexico. It was in the East Pacific Ocean. And so we were confronted with a lot of motion. The heave, pitch and roll of the ship was really, was quite uh, drastic. And we, in fact, had to slow down because we were going to, the, the hurricane itself was slow moving. And so when we were going at nine or 10 knots, we were going to go right into this hurricane. So we had to actually um, kind of switch gears and turn off our engines for two days and run off jet pumps um, just so that we were only traveling about two to three knots in order not to kind of smack into this hurricane. But in the meantime, you can imagine there was a lot of motion on the ship. and. Mm -hmm. Um, I it actually changed the trajectory of my my practice and, and what I was doing, because I at first was trying to create these very kind of delineated um, kind of tightly painted paintings, um, thinking about um, mapping data and, and trying to translate this sort of deep ocean terrain. And what I realized was in the moment I had to kind of I had to kind of embrace the reality of the situation. And so I actually started pouring the paint onto the canvas. When I poured the, the the paint on the canvas, this the kind of patterns that are created are actually mimicking other patterns that you can find in nature. So, for instance, um, they look like like strata of rock layer. Um, they look like uh, rock layers. They look like um, stromatolite fossils. They look like ocean eddies and waves. And so, I love that sort of play in in the sort of poured paint. And they, they would become a backdrop for these other types of overlays of, of mapping data. But um, that that experience of being on the ship and with the motion was was it was an incredible challenge to overcome. And uh, but but really kind of uh, had this um, wonderful kind of result in kind of shifting what I was doing that I continue to do in my work. So if your first experience is trailing a hurricane. What drew you back to a second residency at sea? That's funny. That's a good question. Um, it's interesting. I, you know, I had never really sailed on the ship, you know, you know, other than some small, you know, experiences. It had never been on a research vessel and and had this kind of experience. And miraculously, I really, I, I had my sea legs from day one. I never got sick, even through this sort of close counter, close encounter with the hurricane. Um, I fell in love with being out on the open ocean. It was, 
a combination of just the the solitude of it, um, even though I was with, you know, a large group of people on the ship, um, there was uh, just this peacefulness of being out on the open ocean that coupled with the excitement of working with scientists and exploring and, and learning and discovering, you know, we were uncovering new terrain that was um, that we were mapping as we were passing along the ocean floor and, and most of the um, world's oceans had not been mapped in high resolution. We've, we're sort of in a, in a period now where um, scientists are actively trying to map as much as they can by 2030, but we're still only about 10% there. Um, and so it was so exciting to be uncovering this new terrain you know, on our computer screens through sound waves. And then I was sort of incorporating that data into my work. So of the seven residencies at sea you participated in, which has had the greatest impact on you? So that's a great question. And I would have to say that while all of the residencies at sea have been, you know, amazing in different ways, um, my two favorite and, and the ones that were the most impactful were the ones where I went down in Alvin, um, the deep sea submersible. Um, those two expeditions were back to back in the fall of 2018. One was um, diving down off the coast of Costa Rica and the other one was off the coast of Mexico in the Gulf of California. And the experience of going down in Alvin um, is just, you know, an unparalleled experience. Um, it is, you know, by far, you know, the most incredible experience I've ever had, you know, in my lifetime. Um, and I, I, I can't stress enough just what it, what it impact it had on me, not only just as a human being and just understanding my sense of place in the world, but, um, and, and how small we are, but, but just how it affected me creatively, um, as an artist and, um, how inspiring it was. So it just, it was really a, a truly, um, spiritual and metaphysical experience. So going down in Alvin is akin to going to the moon. Very few people have done it. I don't know how far down you went. It goes, they go to, Alvin goes down miles and it's not very big. For me, if I knew I was going to have the chance to go, I would both be elated and scared. How do you prepare for the idea that you're in this cramped space several miles below the ocean and then seeing things that are really bizarre, but no one else has seen? The opportunity to do something that, as you mentioned, so few people have had the opportunity to do um, is really supersedes. It's any type of fear that I have. Um, I am a little bit claustrophobic, but I have definitely had a fear of being in enclosed spaces. And I also have a fear of heights, but I will tell you that um, any, any fear that I have of being in, in an enclosed space um, was overrided by this just incredible opportunity. So yeah, you're in a six foot sphere, a titanium sphere, um, and you can barely stand up in it. Um, and there's, you know, two, there's two passengers and a pilot. Um, the experience of descending the water column is really, um, again, the most incredible experience because you really get the sense of how deep the ocean is. You know, I went down 2,200 meters. We are descending without any motors. You know, we are descending, just kind of free falling for an hour and a half before we hit the bottom. Um, the, the sense of scale is, it's hard to describe and it's impossible to understand when you're just looking at video footage, you know, or watching Blue Planet say, you can't, you don't get a sense of how far down that actually is. Um, some of the, the things that I saw, you know, we were in, off the coast of Mexico, we were exploring a really interesting system of hydrothermal vents it's where two tectonic plates are separating and you have superheated ocean water that gets sucked down into this opening and heated back up and, and um, expelled. You also have chemicals that are spewing out of, of this opening in the ocean floor, this fissure. And so you also have kind of these mineral deposits of chimneys that are emitting um, you know, all of these chemicals um, it, this particular location was really incredible because it's where two land masses are really close together. You have the uh, Baja California and the coast of Mexico that are very close together. 
Um, and so they, these two land masses, it's a nascent sea in between the Gulf of California with this, you know, opening as I described. But these two land masses are dropping down sediment onto the vents. And so it's creating this um, situation where they're called sedimented vents, where you have kind of tributaries dropping down sediment on top of this superheated water and chemicals and essentially causing um, oil to form very quickly here um, because of all this heat and pressure. And so it's a really unique location, um, one of the only places in the world where this is ha happening. And you have, again, these really interesting, you know, um, chimneys and and hydrothermal vents. And, and again, and all of the the chemosynthetic life that that subsists on chemicals that are coming out of the ocean floor. And so that's what's really the most incredible part is learning and seeing firsthand right. out these systems um, that are really an analog for life on other planets and, and for origins of life, um, where, you know, where we came from. So how did you translate that into your artwork? Well, so I'm, you know, again, I'm really interested in sort of looking, my work is pretty abstract. And so I'm, I'm not necessarily painting exactly what I see and, and trying to replicate that landscape, that sort of really bizarre landscape. I'm really interested in trying to understand the systems and the processes um, and these networks that are kind of hidden from view. And so when I say hidden from view, I mean, not only sort of the landscape itself um, and working with mapping data to uncover that um, in my paintings, but also thinking about on a microscopic level what's hidden from view. And so I'm really interested in, and I've worked with a lot of microbiologists looking at microbes you know, on a microscopic level and understanding the kind of networks that they create and how they are creating structures that maximize their own existence and growth um, through allowing the flow of oxygen and chemicals um, and, and creating these sort of, these kind of open structures. Um, I'll just quick, quickly speak about the um, interactive installation. Um, this is a permanent installation at the Georgia Museum of Art where um, I collaborated with Mandy Joy, who is a microbiologist and who I went down in Alvin with off the coast of Mexico to this place that I'm describing, um, Guaymas right. Space. Um, essentially, I took my experience going down in Alvin and seeing, as I was descending the water column, seeing in the darkness all of this bioluminescent life and translated that into a piece um, that is a 64 foot long sculptural installation. The sculptures themselves are these sort of abstracted, um, hexagonal forms that are inspired by hydrocarbon structures that form the oil I mentioned that's that's forming in this location um, at the bottom of the ocean. And then these sculptures are backlit with LED lights that are triggered by motion sensors on either end of this very long piece. Um, and so when you walk by the piece or when you approach the piece, it triggers this disturbance in the piece that sets off um, trails of light that go down the piece. And these trails of light are mimicking um, one of the organisms that um, are really prolific in this area um, in Guaymas Basin called um, siphonophore. And siphonophores are pretty common, um, but they are related to a jellyfish and they have these sort of long tentacles and they react to a predator by sending trails of light down all its tentacles to um, confuse the predator. And so, anyway. Well, I can I can see that a 64 foot installation is going to seem large to people, and it's a great metaphor for how deep the ocean is. So, I love that. Um, so, I typically end a podcast by asking my guests to issue a call for action. I'd like to ask you this question in two parts. In the first part, I'd like to know what you've learned in your seven journeys aboard research vessels that concerns you most about the state of the ocean? You know, one, you know, one of the one of the trips that I went on and, you know, we were just talking about it, the one in Mexico, I'm um, in Guaymas Basin. I did see, um, you know, in addition to this incredible ecosystem of life um, that are surviving on chemicals, we did observe plastics at the very bottom. You know, we're talking over a mile deep in the very deep wow. sea on plastic bottles. And we also saw some damage. Um, corals. Um, two of my collaborators are um, 
very invested in working in the Gulf of Mexico to study the degradation of corals over the past 12 or 13 years since the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And so I'm actually working on a project now um, that is uh, part of a restoration effort to kind of help um, rehabilitate, rehabilitate these corals um, in the deep part of the Gulf of Mexico. But so yeah, you know, there are so many things to be concerned about um, in terms of, um, you know, ocean acidification, in terms of, you know, ocean warming, everything is connected. And, you know, you know, every, every ecosystem you know, in the ocean is, is affected by, you know, these changes and these sort of human caused impacts. Well, th there is a definitely a bleak side to it. But in order to go forward, we have to have some sort of hope. So what did you learn about the, the on board the vessels that gives you some hope for the future? I am very hopeful. Um, I, I think my hope is sort of twofold. I think, you know, the ocean is a resilient system. And um, I am most, I've learned so much about um, microbial growth and microbial networks and how, how resilient microbes are and how microbes can really um, kind of respond to perturbations and react and, and sort of adjust um, and, and almost correct in a lot of ways um, some of the damage that we've caused. The other part of it though is, um, has not, not necessarily to do with the ocean itself, but with humanity. My, my being out in the ocean, and my having the opportunity to go on research vessels is a response to an interest in bringing people together to learn and to grow together. And so, for instance, all of my, um, most of my residencies have been um, supported by the National Science Foundation that are interested in broader impacts of, of scientific research. And they're interested in having people come to help communicate that science. And so for me, as an artist that's often working with scientists and collaborating, I really get the sense that there is a, a real, um, there is a spark right now. There's an energy in bringing differing voices together to solve global issues and challenges. And so, you know, that's part of, um, you know, the National Academy of Sciences um, has um, the Keck Futures Initiative, which is, um, was something that supported a project that I'm part of called the Ocean Memory Project. Um, and the Ocean Memory Project is about bringing voices together, bringing artists and people in humanities with scientists to think about the ocean and to, to think in different ways about how to solve these sort of global challenges. And I think that's the, that's the path forward is people working together instead of being in their silos, people coming together to think about these issues and come up with solutions. And so I'm really hopeful because I think that I think that that there's a real kind of collective push towards this, and so I'm I'm excited to be part of it. Right. Well, I think we agree on all those points, and that's what I'm trying to do with this podcast. So, Rebecca, I'm extremely grateful you agreed to be on the Women in the Water Artivist series. I expect listeners will have found our conversation about your work at sea extremely interesting. I'd like to remind listeners that I've been speaking with Rebecca Webster. Her work is situated at the intersection of art, science, and technology is inspired by her experiences with the natural world. Our conversation today focused on her experiences as an artist aboard scientific research vessels. Rebecca Butstein is the latest guest on the Women Mind the Water Artivist series podcast. The series can be viewed on womenmindthewater.com, Museum on Main Street, and YouTube. An audio-only version of this podcast is available on womenmindthewater.com, on iTunes, and Spotify. Women Mind the Water is grateful to Jane Rice for the use of her song, Women of Water. All rights for the Women Mind the Water name and logo belong to Pam Ferris Olson. This is Pam Ferris Olson.